In this video, we are going to look at making chloric acid, HCl03. And it would not be a video of mine without talking about some information. So chloric acid is much more reactive than perchloric acid. Perchloric acid has four oxygens, which is a stable configuration. The odd number of O3 makes each one of these oxygens not bonded as well to the chlorine as if there were four. And we can look at this sort of like oxygen exists separately. O2 in the air is very stable. The ozone is made of O3 the three oxygens. And ozone, we know, is extremely reactive. So the three oxygens is why chloric acid becomes much more reactive than perchloric acid. And if we look at this diagram here, I know it's not the best, but we have one chlorine atom in the middle with three oxygens evenly spaced around it. And each one of these bonds is not as strong as if there were a fourth one right here, say. And the hydrogen in, hy in sorry, chloric acid is bonded to this outside oxygen right here. And because of the three oxygens, chloric acid is a very strong acid and oxidizing agent. The first person ever credited to make chloric acid and to record it was Jabir ibn Hayyan around 800 AD, but it wasn't until 1772 that Joseph Priestley perfected the process. Chloric acid is only stable when temperatures are below 5 degrees Celsius and up to a 30% concentration. Either one of these, either a higher temperature or a higher concentration, does cause it to become very reactive and sometimes explosive on its own. We know that chloric acid reacts with metals such as aluminum, iron, magnesium, and zinc. And we also know it's very reactive with organic compounds, especially alcohols, and with other acids such as nitric acid or hydrochloric acid. It will also undergo a pretty bad spontaneous reaction with strong reducing agents. It can be made in one of two ways. One is barium chlorate plus sulfuric acid yields two chloric acids plus the barium sulfate. Or heating three HClO, which is hypochlorous acid, which will give you your chloric acid and two hydrochloric acids. But there's a third. I only said two. What's going on here? Anyways, this is what I will be using. It's potassium chlorate and sulfuric acid. And when you combine those two, you get your chloric acid and potassium sulfate. And like I said, this is what I'll be using. Because the reaction is so exothermic, the reaction between the potassium chlorate and the sulfuric acid here, the chloric acid often breaks down. And these are the two methods it does most often. The first one is eight chloric acids break down into four perchloric acids plus two waters plus two chlorine gas plus three O2 gas. The second one is three chloric acids breaks down into one perchloric acid plus water plus two ClO2. This is nasty stuff. This is chlorine dioxide, and this stuff is not only dangerous to a human being, but it is very explosive on its own. It is one of the reasons why when you work with this stuff and you're adding some of these things up here, you get small explosions immediately, and it's because of this chlorine dioxide. Very dangerous, and you need to protect yourself from this stuff when you're working on it. And though I mentioned a couple times, the materials we need are potassium chlorate and sulfuric acid. So this is 98% sulfuric acid that I'm talking about. So for every one gram of potassium chlorate, solid, we need 0.97 grams of 98% sulfuric acid. Now, I wanted to convert this to milliliters because it's much easier for every gram to figure out how many milliliters I need of this than trying to weigh it because the amount is so small. We can do that here. We have 98% sulfuric acid, and it has a specific gravity of 1.84 grams per milliliter. You can look this up. It's pretty simple. And we're going to use a formula, volume equals mass over density. So for our, our volume, which we don't know, we're going to put the 0.97 grams, which is the mass, over the density, which is 1.84 grams per milliliter. And when we work that out, we get the volume is 0.527 milliliters or 0.53 milliliters. So for every gram of potassium chlorate, we need 0.53 milliliters of 98% per, sulfuric acid. And because of my personal situation here, I can measure out these small quantities like this easier than I can measure out exactly that amount. In our methods, so I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to start with a small amount and test a few things, and then I'm going to make a larger amount afterwards and test a couple other things. So we'll see how all this goes. Um, the primary method is in an extremely well-controlled lab. You can very, very slowly add cold sulfuric acid to a very cold solution of potassium chlorate. And this is done over about five hours. It's done slowly and it has to be monitored very carefully because of how dangerous it is. I am not going to take a chance on that because if this stuff blew up, not only would it wreck my glassware, but it's very likely that this acid would get splattered all over the place and ruin a lot of other things. So, yeah, that's not going to happen. But there is another way to do this, and it is really rather simple, although it is still very dangerous. And that is, of course, to do this outdoors. So you will have a beaker set up here. You put in your 
volume of sulfuric acid that you figured out from up here and then you slowly add your potassium chlorate usually in small measured volumes and without anything else added to that these two will actually combine relatively well without reacting too much at that point you then add whatever you're going to test in the chloric acid you cannot add these the other way around anybody who's ever taken a pile of potassium chlorate and dropped a couple drops of sulfuric acid concentrated sulfuric acid on it knows what happens the whole thing will go up in pretty fierce flames pretty quickly so you can't do that you have to have your sulfuric acid in here first then add your larger amounts of potassium chlorate slowly until it's all added mixed together and then from a long distance you can see how long i don't know how long it'll be three four feet i will have a spoon that i can add these different items right here sulfur magnesium sugar and urea at least and uh, we'll just see how each one of them react this promises to be a really energetic experiment that's for sure so let's go ahead and make our chloric acid as discussed, these are the two things we need to make our chloric acid, 98% sulfuric acid and potassium chlorate. To start, here is 3 grams of potassium chlorate pre-weighed. And as discussed, 0.53 times 3 is actually 1.59. I've got this at 1.6, close enough. And we have our sulfuric acid. These are just a few of the things that I'll be using when I do this chloric acid experiment. I have a very good pair of chemically resistant gloves here, a long pair of tweezers by which I will drop different items into the chloric acid. I have a um, polycarbonate face shield, and I also have a full gas mask and a full length chemically resistant apron I'll be using. You just cannot be too careful when doing this experiment. I will also have these two sodium bicarbonate solution containers with me. The one on the right is a spray bottle, of course, which is nice because you can shoot it from far away if you need to. And the one on the left is a half a liter ready to go to dilute it, the chloric acid at the end of the experiment, and also for bigger spills. I'm also going to be doing this experiment outdoors. I do have a fume hood that works really well, but the weather's great and why take any chances if things spatter? So outdoors it is. And finally, I made this sort of quirky spoon thing so that when the sulfuric acid is inside this 100 milliliter beaker here, I'll be able to add this potassium chlorate a little bit at a time, like so, while I am at least four feet away, and I'll be wearing gloves at the time too. I place around that 100 milliliter beaker some sodium bicarb solution and then just added ice cubes to it because this is highly exothermic as we talked about. So I'm going to first uh, put in the 1.6 milliliters of sulfuric acid. which is not much at all, of course, but this is all just testing how this will go. And I'm now going to add the first amount of potassium chlorate. And the second amount, and from here on out, I'm going to be wearing a face mask at minimum, so my voice might be a little funky. And to get the best reaction here, I am going to mix these up a little bit more than what uh, they were by just pouring them in here. The first thing I'm adding here is a little bit of plain old table sugar. The next thing is uh, some garden vegetable straws that I have here. I'm going to break off a small piece. All right, some garden vegetables. I'll go ahead and mix that in a little better. And lastly, just for this starter experiment here, we're going to do a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. It's around 70%, so there is some water in here. Down to three, one, two, three. Chloric acid, man, you can't beat it. All right, we're gonna move on now to a slightly larger experiment. Before we do that, I happen to have a popsicle stick here that I was gonna use for something different, but let's just see if what it does to the wood. Let's take a look at this wood though. Definitely burnt. 
For the second part of this test, 10 grams of potassium chlorate pre-weighed. And 0.53 times 10 for our sulfuric acid is of course 5.3 milliliters, which I'm going to put into the small beaker also. Okay. Part two is ready to go. It's the same thing with larger quantities. I have the uh, scooper here. I'll be putting the potassium chlorate in. I switched out because the volumes are just more and we're ready to go. Once again, that's a sodium bicarbonate solution around the sides of that beaker there and I just added some ice because of the exothermic reaction. I am now adding the 5.3 milliliters of 98% sulfuric acid. I'll now be adding the first quantity of the potassium chlorate. The yellowish stuff you see near the bottom there is the um, chlorine dioxide, a serious gas and potentially very explosive. I'm now adding the second quantity here. And the last bit of potassium chlorate. As sulfur makes this reaction a bit unstable, let's add a little bit of sulfur. As all that smoke made this thing go out of focus, I just wanted to show you the very end of the process here. One of the best reasons you do this outdoors. This is a new batch, the exact same ingredients. Like sulfur, combining metals such as magnesium, create a reaction. I don't know how much this will react, but here's some urea. I'd say that's pretty reactive. We're going to stop with adding any more of that. And to finish off this last batch, I'm just going to add some more powdered magnesium.